Okay, sounds good. All right, so today is a very interesting uh, session, at least to me, something that I'm really fascinated with, and that is deep fakes. Um, fun and exciting stuff in the deep fake world going on. Um, and, you know, it, it blows my mind the way that uh, we've really just accelerated in how digital image manipulation has taken place over the last, you know, five, 10 years. It just blows my mind. Now, I have a little photography background. That's kind of where I come into this. Uh, it's actually what got me into computers. Uh, back in the day, I worked for the U.S. Navy. I was an avionics tech. I uh, used to fix radar jammers. One of the guys on the ship I was on, which was the USS America, um, he had one of these things called an Amiga 500. And it was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, he had a little hand scanner. He could scan images and digitally manipulate them. That got me fascinated <clears throat> with uh, digital imaging. And so I went from doing film photography to getting into the digital side. And what we've seen lately uh, kind of rides along with that uh, and marries that in my InfoSec career, which is fascinating to me. So that's really what, you know, one of the reasons I want to talk about this today and one of the reasons I really like this session. So a little bit about me. Yes, I'm old. You can tell by the gray hair. Somehow or another, I've, I've grown like this. I don't know, gray thing on the side of my nose here during COVID. I don't know what that's all about, but I'm starting to get a little bit uh, long on the tooth. But, you know, I've been in this industry since, gosh, the 1990s. Uh, around 1995 is really when I got into IT and security. I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in um, medical. I've worked for the Department of Defense. I was a contractor with the U.S. Army for about 10 years, where eventually I was the security manager for the Second Regional Cyber Center Western Hemisphere, which is a really impressive name of an organization until you have to say that every time you answer the phone. Uh, also, if any of you are CISSPs, I was the director of member relations and services for a couple of years. Uh, try not to throw fruit, tomatoes, whatever at me. If you had a bad experience, I'm sorry. I did try. Uh, but enough about me. I mean, I, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, very interesting to me to see where we're going on this digital side of things. I do work for No Before. We're one of the sponsors of the conference here. Yes, I was accepted to do this talk before we ever sponsored. Um, so uh, I do a lot of talks, though. Um, what we do at, at No Before is we do uh, security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. We're all about the human element, which is where this really ties into things. Uh, it fascinates me to see how humans react to things. And this just kind of, you know, goes along with that. So um, a bit of the agenda today, uh, how this all got started, how this talk got started, uh, the progression of digital fakes, uh, potential impact detection, and defending against the fakery and silliness. So let's start off with how this got started. I really got started with this. Um, one of my colleagues is Javad Malik. He's over in the UK. If you've seen the CISSP videos or... Um, let's see, accepted the risk, things like that. A uh, great guy, very smart, was with um, uh, uh, 451 Research for a while. Uh, him and I, we, we've been friends for a while. And so we started chatting back and forth on WhatsApp and we started really kind of cranking up the level of how we harassed each other. And at one point then we started switching over to doing screen captures and then modifying it and even like paint or you know whatever, and then putting it back, I can't believe you said this, right? And we started like messing with each other pretty bad in this. Uh, and eventually we reached the point of mutually assured destruction with respect to HR. And we realized, you know, this kind of stuff is actually fairly topical because you can really really mess up somebody's life if you make things like this that are believable. And unfortunately, there's a lot of tools out there already and a lot of things going on uh, that are misinformation, disinformation, and causing problems like that. But, you know, back in my younger years, the stupid things I did and said uh, aren't on the internet forever. Nowadays, though, if you post things up, even if it's not true, a lot of times that person then has to fight out of it, right? And social media has really increased the voice of the individual, but it's also increased the voice of the bots and the the bad actors a lot of times who are actually in there just to see the world burn, right? We, we've seen a lot of that go on from the beginning of the COVID thing to what we're seeing right now with George Floyd. Um, I'm not saying everybody's bad, but we do know that a lot of the social media accounts are being run by bots, trolls, or 
someone you know along that lines not necessarily humans um, or not necessarily humans that are themselves and individuals right i think uh, one of the studies i just saw said 52 percent of the recent stuff having to do with uh, uh, George Floyd and police brutality was actually done by bots or um, trolls uh, on the internet. I mean, it's it's mind boggling. But with this technology that we're seeing here, um, this has a, a potential to really impact people. Also, um, you know, with respect to scams and stuff like that, I'm going to talk about how this can have impact on that as well. But it's it's fascinating technology. It's very useful technology. But it's also very dangerous technology and stuff that we do have to start really watching for. And I don't think a lot of people are. So the next part, progression of digital fakes. Well, I did steal this from Javad. Um, we we had put together this uh, to kind of work together. But Javad showing his researcher side here with the um, 451 research side. Uh, and basically what he's doing, what we're doing here is we're breaking it down into some quadrants um, with deep fakes being down on the bottom, shallow being on the top, text manipulation, simple photo editing, Photoshop, right? And then you get in um, moving over, still on the top uh, top side, but moving to the right, uh, green screen stuff where you're faking the backgrounds, right? Everyone's doing that on Zoom these days, okay? Um, but that is a digital m image manipulation, right? Shows you on an island in the middle of somewhere, whatever. Then you got the, the jib jab style, which is always funny to me still around the holidays where you, know, you put a friend's head on an elf that dances around. Um, that's not super high end stuff though, right? But when you start getting into the deep fakery stuff, that's when you start leveraging the AI or neural networks and, and some of this, you know, this machine learning pieces. Uh, and that includes declothing, um, generating people that don't even exist. How many of you have seen the pictures of things that AI has generated, um, people and faces? And some of them are just horrific, right? Uh, but some of them look absolutely amazing and that person never even existed but based on the picture um the ai created it's really hard to tell that and then you get into the face swap and then you get into the puppetry on the really dynamic stuff um now image manipulation uh starts out in in different kinds of ways right uh we're going to talk about removing people from busy locations this is an imaging stacking things tilt shift photos these, these are different ways to make things look like they should be correct, but they're not. Okay, so force perspective, um, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with image stacking here. Um, this is something I saw years back in Photoshop. It used to be a very manual process, but essentially what you do is you take like a camera, set it up in a place, and over time, you take a whole bunch of pictures from the same spot with people moving around. And then what you do is you take all of these pictures, you stack them on top of each other, and then you start removing people through layers. So before you know it, you have an empty spot because you took a picture when there wasn't somebody occupying that space. And this works with shadows, this works with everything. And what's happened these days is um, scripts are actually being included in Photoshop now that just do it for you. It's super easy to do these days. So um, essentially, you can change what's going on there. Well, the other thing you can do is is you can put people in pictures, um, you know, but you can take somebody out of a picture if you really want to, or make it look like something was completely empty when in fact it wasn't. Um, it's a pretty interesting way to do this. If you're ever doing, you know, you're doing those pictures uh, when you're being a tourist, you know, in DC, very rarely will you find one of those areas there that uh, is empty at any given time. So this is a great trick if you do want to get a picture of, you know, the Lincoln Memorial or something like that. This is what this kind of stuff really excels at. But you can use it for uh, other types of manipulation as well. Now, tilt shift images is something that's come out recently. This is taking something real and making it look very fake. So this is a picture here. This is actually a real town. Uh, and what they did, this is a shot from a drone. Got this from uh, DGI's uh, uh, website here. But this is a shot from a drone. And these work really well if you go up and shoot down at about 45 degrees. And then what you do is you you uh, insert a blur on the top and the bottom piece. So you get one strip that's actually in focus. And then you really boost the saturation up. Um, so this can make things look you know, very, very fake. This is another way to do some image manipulation if you want to make things look fake. But it's if you think about this, just different ways that you can use these techniques um, to either discredit something or, you know, add 
credit to things as well. Now, the most common one I see all the time is force perspective. This is using angles and perspectives to make things look unreal or sometimes even real. So these are force perspective. You can see the dog on the right is really not about nine feet tall, but it's closer to the camera than the people in the background. Same with the guy getting, you know, the bucket over his head. And we've all seen the people holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, things like this, right? Um, this is how you can exaggerate the size of an item or, or an animal. Now, there's other ways to, to deal with this as well. And this is some stuff I've been seeing actually in some media shots lately. Um, if you want to make things look differently when you're doing photographs, you can change what you do through the use of telephoto lenses and things like that. For example, COVID-19, all kinds of stuff going around about social distancing, right? And so a hot topic for some people, not a hot topic for other people. But for those that it's a hot topic for, they get riled up when they see crowds. Well, if you take a camera and you take a long telephoto lens, you stand in front of the people that are stacked kind of at a distance, okay, away directly away from you. Uh, when you take that photo using the telephoto lens, it can make them look like they're right next to each other. But then you swing around and they're actually six, eight feet apart. It just depends on how you do that. So you can actually modify what you want to tell in a story. And I've seen actually some media stories where that happened and, and they showed how the difference from the different perspectives were done in order to change what it is, the story that they wanted to produce for the person there. Now, this is not a political dig. This is not on one side or another. I'm not saying it either way. I'm saying these are techniques that are used consistently to reinforce what it is we want to show. And they're just different tips and tricks that you use with cameras and with angles uh, and perspective in particular. Now, moving forward, getting out of this simple basic stuff here, we've started seeing these face swap apps, right? And these filters, uh, adding cat ears in real time. How many of you remember that? Uh, I mean, we should all remember this one at this point, uh, but the app that aged you by 20 or 30 years, and there was all the hubbub about sending information to the Russians, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, imagine that that stuff is happening in our phones. And, and that's the mind boggling pieces through the use of our phones and some of the stuff is being done on the back end, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got a lot of power in our hands to be able to do this. And if you saw those age ones, man, some of those looked really, really stinking real, right? And face swapping apps, Instagram, all that, man, my wife gets a hold of the filter sometimes. Um, and it's just, oh, um, I, I'm not a big one for those sorts of things, you know, the Facebook filters and, the, but they just love it. Um, and then how about making animals talk? We've seen that sort of thing as well. This is all being done in, in real time or near real time or very short time, just on our phones. Now, where can this go wrong? How many of you, you all saw this? Um, this was a Pakistani minister, minister's, um, live press conference he was giving and the person who is actually streaming it had forgotten they had a cat filter on it, right? Um, kind of awkward, a little weird, right? Um, but it's amazing how powerful this technology is that we have in our phone, right? What if they wanted to do other things rather than cat ears, okay? Um, you know, it, it, it's just kind of an odd thing. I'm, I'm assuming this person... Um, felt pretty bad about what happened one way or another. Um, but it did make me laugh pretty good when we saw this. Um, there's another one here, my talking pet. Now this one's interesting. Uh, you can put words in your pet's mouth, right? Who doesn't want to have their cat talk? Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Um, it's not new tech. This has been around for a while, actually. Um, uh, my talking pet. What's interesting about this, if you want to check it out, there's a video, um, that I linked to down there. I know you can't click it, but you know I'll be here for a second. Uh, but what's interesting about this is when they have the pet talking, it's more than just moving a fake mouth. It's also doing eye twitches or ear movements or the other subtle things that make it look a lot more realistic. Uh, and again, this is happening through phones. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting process, but the manipulation that's happening with that um, it is pretty fascinating, actually, and it's it's fairly well done. I mean, it's not going to convince anyone, but it, it does definitely draw into that, wow, this is actually pretty well done because of the other movements that happen. Now we're going to get into some of the uglier stuff. 
this is the video deep fake apps okay uh, there's several of them out there um, downloadable for github these are free they generally use a gpu and put quite a hurting on gpus uh, when they're doing this processing um, nvidia cards seem to work better than uh, the the radions uh, they're more supported uh, and what this basically does uh, in most cases it takes a, a video and we all know videos are put together at a frame rate of 29.97 you know frames per second here in the us or about 30 frames per second and it basically breaks that down into all the individual frames and then using ai typically tensorflow backend uh, what they're doing is they're looking for faces in every single one of these uh, and they pull out the face um, usually a 128 by 128 uh, pixel square um, or the, that can be changed a little bit but most common is 128 by 128 um, but it will pull the pictures those faces out of every single one of those frames and then what it's going to end up doing is going to kind of replace that build a model on it and put it back together now the one I've been playing with the most is uh, Deep Face Lab. <clears throat> this is where you can get it from. It's free, Windows binaries are downloadable. It's easy to do. It uses uh, TensorFlow as the back end, like I said, um, but the package is, is, is all there, right? Um, I actually did some stuff on my laptop. I have a, a gaming laptop. It's got like a, I think it's a 1080 um, Nvidia card in it and uh, did pretty well. Now. They're not super fast. We're not we're not seeing this in real time at this point, um, and it does take a while. But it's pretty amazing what you can do in about 12 hours. Um, I can produce a a reasonable looking video. I was going to show it here, but I don't think it would stream very well. Um, some of the key things you're looking for here, though, is a general basic facial structure and whether or not they match. The closer it is, the easier it is. Um, but what it does is again, it's going to look at your source, like where you're pulling it from. So you have some video clips of the source. It's gonna look at the destination where you're putting it to. It's gonna identify the faces in those. And then it's actually gonna build like a model of those two. So what happens is when you put it back together, you end up with the eye blinks. You end up with a lot of these various things because it put it together. Now, in the meantime, uh, I'll show you here. This is one I was playing around with. Um, with uh with javad and and tom uh, langford here um this was from lost all the money i think one of their most recent videos which is an awesome money about ceo fraud i love it um it's hilarious check it out if you haven't already lost all the money it's got a catchy tune too um, but you can see here where it's pulled out all of these different faces from there and then of course wherever you're going to put it onto, you're going to end up um taking that and uh you know basically it's going to do the same thing on that side and then what you do is on the on the input type uh, like this, you remove all of the ones you don't want replaced. And it does a pretty good job. It really, really does. Um, the, the video, I, I really wish I could show it. Um, if you hit me up on Twitter, I think maybe I'll make a link to it. Uh, but uh, it, it's amazing what you can do in just a few hours on a laptop these days. Um, now, on the other side of this, uh, one of the drawbacks of doing deep fake videos is Generally speaking, if you're going to use it for an attack vector, it's not going to do voice. Uh, so you need a voice actor to replace the voice on that or another audio clip that's going to do it. Now, these deepfake audio apps are getting more and more popular as well. Um, I've been following uh, one recently. Now, these, again, GitHub most of the time uses the same TensorFlow backend or the GPU to do things. Um, this time it uses audio clips to replace the voice. Um, this one is called real-time voice cloning. It's on GitHub there. Python tool uh, uses some pre-trained models to help out, which is nice. It's not great, but here's the deal. Um, I, I'm actually following this one, and not a day goes by that I'm not seeing people interacting with this, asking questions, making changes. It's very, very active in how it's being um, used and improved. Um, you can still hear the differences, uh, but it's gotten a whole lot better. And it is near real time when you're doing the voice cloning. Um, <clears throat> pretty fascinating to check out some of these things, but you start putting these things together, start using this, and you know it, it can get pretty ugly. And I'll talk about that here. So potential impact of fakes. <clears throat> so this is where we get into what are we doing with these things? Uh, what can be done with these? 
why does it matter and why should I pay attention? Well, first of all, it's an InfoSec conference, okay? And it wouldn't be a good InfoSec conference if I didn't show some sort of a Sun Tzu slide, okay? So all warfare is based on deception. Yes, uh, we've all seen this quote. Uh, it, it is a very true quote. And if you don't think we're dealing with warfare these days, um, we, we can definitely chat about that piece of it because a lot of what we see, a lot of what I see, you know, through no before, through, through the areas that I'm at, um, we're seeing not the kids in the basement drinking Mountain Dew, eating pizza. It, it, those aren't the ones doing the bulk of these kinds of attacks. We're actually seeing organized crime, pretty significant organized crime uh, going on with this. We're seeing nation states taking part of this. Um, if you look at, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, some of the uh, the bots that were going on. Uh, one of the Carnegie Mellon, I think it was, uh, studies showed that almost half of the coronavirus tweets that were going out there at the time uh, were from bots, okay? Um, and they were following the Russian and Chinese playbook very, very closely. It's about dividing. It's about uh, causing division within um, a, a group of people or a nation. This is the kind of stuff that really honestly is going on. I know it sounds super like tin tinfoil hatty, but this is really going on. And so we have to take this stuff seriously because it does have real world impacts. This is not one or two guys trying to scam somebody out of some money. Um, they're actually pretty significant attacks. And honestly, they're, they're really stinking good at them. <clears throat> so we talk about business email compromise, right? Um, you know, CEO fraud's a big deal. Um, we see this more and more. This is the kind of deception stuff that we get. Uh, there's usually not a payload. Uh, we got emails here, but sometimes you can get phone calls that confirm the emails. And if you can change that voice right away, you know, that's that's a problem. So we see a lot of this kind of stuff in the deception in phishing, in smishing, and vishing, especially a lot of deception. How many of you are watching some of these other things here, right? And, and seeing how vishing is being used. The social engineering skills over the phone are phenomenal, right? If you saw Leith or any of the others that talk about stuff, it's amazing what you can do with just a phone call. Uh, this is the kind of attacks we're seeing. Now, we got to understand when it comes to deception, our brains are amazing, amazing things. If you ever want to see some really cool stuff, check out the series called Brain Games. Uh, I don't know if it's on Hulu or one of those. I don't remember where it's streaming now, but it is fascinating. Some of the stuff that we kind of think we know about our brains, but really don't. I, I absolutely love the series because I love to learn about human behavior and, and, and kind of the vulnerabilities that we all have. Well, one of the things, our brain's job is to filter, interpret, and present reality. Sounds kind of deep, right? <clears throat> we assume that what we smell, what we hear, what we taste, um, what we feel, all of these things are absolutely real. That's reality, right? But what we got to understand is our brain actually filters the inputs that we receive. You're getting sensory inputs all day long. Some things are being ignored. Certain smells that you don't smell, right? There's the, the old joke about, you know, the cat litter box, right? Uh, there was that whole series of commercials on that um, where your nose is dead to the cat smell. Well, this is your brain blocking things out. But it also does some other amazing things. If you're, you know, if you look left or right with your eyes right now, how many of you see your nose when you're not thinking about it? Well, most of us don't, right? Because our, our brain is actually filtering out that portion of our vision and replacing it with the other image uh, on the other side. It's amazing what our brains do. But these can be tricked. These inputs can be, uh, can be tricked, oftentimes through emotions. That's one of the most powerful ways to trick your brain is through emotions. Um, we see these kind of things just all the time um, in the attack vectors that we have here. Um, so let's see. When we're talking about attack vectors, you know, talking about video or photo fakes, how can these be used? Well, how many of you know about uh, romance scams? How many of you know somebody that's been caught up in romance scams? Um, I'm on the advisory board for uh, a group called the Cybercrime Support Network. They run fraudsupport.org. And this is a, a website where people can go if they're victims of cybercrime and actually go there and um, get kind of directed in the right places to 
um, report it correctly. What are the next steps? Who do I talk to to get my money back? Uh, it's a fantastic organization. But one of the top things they see is romance scams. So what happens? You know, when we talk to somebody, if you've ever talked to somebody that's been involved in a romance scam, oftentimes what we will tell them is, um, you know, uh, get them to do something and send you a picture or a video of them doing something, right? Drink a cup of tea with your pinky out, um, something like that. Well, that oftentimes will kind of blow the whole charade right there. Uh, for those that are really emotionally invested, Sometimes they'll believe whatever cover story the, the attackers will give and it continues on. But that's a quick way to dispel what's going on. But now, using some of these apps, using some of these uh, different tools that we've talked about here, um, they can actually create videos that makes it look like them. Now understand, a lot of romance scams, uh, they come about and they use personas of people that are, um, or, or photos at least, of people that are influential, uh, they look like doctors, sometimes celebrities, right? Yanni fell in love with me. You know, that's, that's a great one for the elderly folks. Uh, they'll use that. Well, there's materials out there that we can get from a lot of these people, speaking of conferences, speaking of movies, whatever, and use that to create that. Well, now imagine if we tell somebody, hey, you know, have them send you a picture of them uh, drinking tea with their pinky out, and they now replace the celebrity's face on that, as they record it, right? These things can lead to actually uh, getting rid of some of the steps that we take to offset some of the significant scams that are going on, right? Um, what about outrage? Man, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't looked at the news lately, there is a hell of a lot of outrage going on out there, um, and rightfully so, right? But outrage is an emotion that drives human action. It's one of the most powerful uh, emotions to drive human action, that and anger. Um, so clickbait is something we see, and we see it a lot of times in, you know, the, the regular ads. Well, imagine this. Um, you're whomever, you, you want to take somebody, a celebrity, politician, whatever, and you end up putting one of these uh, videos together that makes it look like they did something completely outrageous, okay? And then they, 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 put that together with, if you, you know, if you can't believe this, let's get them, you know, thrown out, go sign this petition. So you send them to a place where now, you know, of course, you've got to verify who you are, you know, everyone expects that. So we need your name, address, social security number, um, the name of your first pet, uh, mom's maiden name, right? All this kind of stuff. Well, the people are so amped up. Um, they got the, 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 the endorphins are, are flowing through their head, they're upset, they're angry, they don't apply common sense. And that's where people can be tricked into doing that. Um, it's a great place for the bad guys to be able to leverage this, outrage clickbait. Uh, and that leads into the election influencing, right? So we've got an election coming up in November. If we survive 2020, we have an election coming up. Uh, when, when this happens, what would keep these, you know, 50% of troll accounts from taking a well-done deep fake and launching something absolutely outrageous out there on either side? I'm not, I, this is not a political thing. It is an either side sort of thing. But what if they do that right before the election and people are so angry and outraged when they go to vote, even though eventually it's going to be proven fake, by that time, the vote is already cast. So elections can be influenced through this. Local elections could be influenced through this. There is a lot of power in what's going on using some of these deep fakes. Also imagine if you're somebody whose job, you know, there for a long time, Disney was really selective about what it is their people did. And when something bad came up in the background, um, they had a, you know, they could get canned, right? Um, but there are a lot of jobs in public facing sorts of situations where reputation is key. Well, what if you start applying some of these things uh, with weaponized photos or videos? Uh, this is one right here. Uh, these are kind of interesting. By placing the bubbles in certain things, it makes your mind draw some conclusions, right? This is just another way that our brains filter into things. Uh, if we were to able to, you know, do this and, and show things in selective ways, there is a chance that you could impact somebody's life. 
And the bad thing about today is these things stay out there for a very, very long time. It's not just like, you know, your circle of friends, it gets forgotten about. Employers go to do searches later on. These could impact you for a very, very long time. Now on the audio fake side, same sort of thing, romance scams. You know, you have the voice of Yanni professing love to grandma, whoever in the, in the nursing home. She believes him and is going to send money so that he can come visit her, right? Um, it, it just adds to that. Election influencing. Again, what about a fake phone call intercepted? And they're taking these and, and turning around and using that as a weaponized attack. That is something we have to watch for. We have to be careful for. And then, you know, CEO fraud or other types of business email compromise. Oh, I got an email says I need to uh, transfer a whole bunch of money. And then the CEO called me and said, you better do that. Well, now the person is doing that because they've let their guard down. They have two points of verification. Not that they called the CEO, but the CEO calls them or the quote unquote CEO. Now, this was something that um, they've alluded to in this particular um, deal here. Uh, I think this is rather interesting uh, what's happening here. Uh, they say that a, a, a deep fake was used to mimic the voice of a CEO. Uh, in a wire transfer thing. Um, there's been no evidence to that, um, but there are people that, that absolutely believe it. Uh, I can tell you right now with the different technologies that I've listened to and seen in play, it's not really something I think that um, is very likely because you can definitely still tell the difference. Uh, however, it is something that I think is going to be changing in the next couple of years to where we're gonna have to watch that sort of thing. Um, in this case, again, uh, they they stated that it was the CEO. <clears throat> They're just sure that it was a CEO. It could have actually been somebody with a very similar voice to the CEO that actually did um, kind of copy that name. And that's the problem. Executives, a lot of times, especially depending on the organization, they do talks. They do these sorts of things that have them out there publicly or advertisements, and it gives people a chance to actually hear them and then try to replicate that. Uh, so this was the first one that I saw where they had actually kind of blamed it on that. Now, when I was at RSA earlier this year, and I can't believe that was still this year, it feels like so long ago, uh, there was a booth that was set up and they were actually um, doing call centers. Uh, apparently they handled a lot of call center stuff. And their big thing was about catching deep fakes in the audio. And so I asked the guy, I said, you know, have you ever actually seen it happen in the real world yet? And his answer was, he kind of pointed to this. And I said, well, you know, that's still kind of under debate. Have you actually seen it? And, and he had to admit that, no, they, there hasn't been a verified uh, point of it. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important to start thinking about it. And what their stuff did is when you call into one of these big data centers, um, they start looking at you and trying to validate you immediately. So this is anti-fraud measures. They're looking for, are you calling from the region you say you're in? Is it from a cell phone? Um, and now they're looking at your voice. They're listening to your voice and trying to determine whether there's trickery going on with your voice. Uh, these are not necessarily immediate disqualifiers, but by the time you get to a person on the other end, uh, you know, to actually help you, they can actually give you kind of a risk score, if you will, based on the sorts of things that have happened, even just leading up to that person. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing. I thought it was uh, um, quite eye-opening. And if any of you that are on here actually work in a call center where this is deployed, I'd love to hear more about that. Please put some in the chat down there uh, because I think it's pretty amazing. But while I don't think it's happening now, I think it's going to continue to happen more and more. And even as we start using more biometrics, including voice for authentication, I think we're gonna have to be real, real careful with this. So speaking of the detection, let's talk about how you detect these things. Well, there's always artifacts available uh, in whatever's done, video, voice, whatever. There's always gonna be artifacts. So when you're doing the video stuff, um, there's going to be pixel smoothing around where they cut that 128 by 128 piece out and replace the frame uh, at the face in there. There's definitely going to be that in there. Um, there's compression artifacts in video. Now, there's ways to try to cover this up. So you take a video, you create a deep fake, 
and then you re-encode it three or four times to where the quality is just utter crap, uh, it's going to be even harder to pick it out of that, right? Uh, but there will be compression artifacts in there. In the audio side, there's going to be some artifacts also. And this comes down to us being humans. We hear sounds in certain ways, and our brain, our filters in our brain, remember we talked about that, will actually put these things together, and the word is now something that is identifiable to us. If you've ever listened to anyone with a very strong accent, uh, some accents are easier for us to listen to than others, probably on, a, on an individual basis. But sometimes if you've ever noticed, you don't understand what they're saying until a second or so after they've said it. That's where your mind has put together all these different things and boom, now it makes sense to you. Um, our brains are great at putting those pieces back together. The AI a lot of times will put the audio back together, for example, where it makes sounds that our tongue cannot make that quickly. Um, we adjust subconsciously when we say some of these words, um, but our, our tongue can't be in an S sound and you know a, a click sound at the same time sort of thing. Uh, it's just not feasibly possible, but the AIs will generate that sound pattern and it can be picked up. Um, the waveforms, how they're created digitally, you can see the waveforms and spot some of those things. Now, as AIs get better at this, as the tools get better, you can expect these things to kind of fall away and become a little bit harder to judge. Um, but there are places that are doing this. Uh, I know YouTube, Facebook um, may already be doing some of this, right? Um, there's going to be some automation, but what happens is not for everybody. Uh, not every company is gonna be deploying this in their defensive uh, posture yet. Uh, the easiest way or, or one of the better ways that I think we're going to see happening here is using neural networks to identify neural networks, right? We always play that whack-a-mole game. The, the, the bad guys get ahead, then we, you know, whack that mole and then boom, they pop up over here. We're seeing that in AI <clears throat> with the attack and defense side of things as well. But I think that's going to be a key player in this. Now, what is a problem is the human bias issue. So deep fakes will enhance our prejudices and biases, and we all have them. I don't care who you are, we all have these. Biases being, <clears throat> you don't need something high tech to convince you of something you already half believe in, okay? So this has never been more apparent than in those romance scams, <clears throat> where you actually show somebody the error in what happened, like they can't produce this, and then they'll make up some sort of a deal. Um, some sort of a story about why they couldn't do the picture or or better yet you show them a photo of that person that was sent to the victim and another profile and say this is really what it is and the people go oh well yeah you know I use that because I'm trying to stay low from blah, blah and the people will believe that because they already want to believe that that's the bias issue and we don't have to have absolutely perfect fakes to get people to believe it the fact is the truth is out there, we just have to look for it, meaning we have to take the time to examine it a little bit and see, you know, be critical about what it is we're seeing and hearing, especially when it's something extravagant. Um, so how do we defend ourselves? First of all, this is a social engineering thing. For social engineering, we always need to understand that <clears throat> it's an emotional attack. So if you get the email, the text message, the phone call, whatever it is, and it elicits a strong emotional reaction, Take a deep breath and focus on applying your critical thinking, right? There's a system one, system two thinking thing. Um, emotions drive us straight into our kind of primal, instinctual emotions uh, and reactions. And it really blocks out the way that we can think critically. So we have to consciously step back and do that. Of course, they use greed, right? The Nigerian print scam. We all know about that. That's been around for... Uh, you know, since the dawn of time, uh, you all know that happened back before uh, before digital. They used to actually have to like lick stamps, put them on envelopes and send them where now I can send 50,000 phishing emails for 65 bucks. You know, uh, that's why that one's still around. But greed is is a key one there. It's a something for nothing. Curiosity, you know, look at clickbait ads. Um, they tell you a little bit, don't tell you everything. Um, and now you're curious. You want to go check it out. It's a... Um, like an information gap theory thing on that. Self-interest, um, urgency. There's almost always a sense of urgency and that sense of urgency keeps your mind flooded and your brain flooded with all of these 
you know, different, um, you know, chemicals that really impact how we can critically think. That's why urgency is such a big thing. Now, fear, people will tend to um, back away from fear as much as they do uh, aggressively go for it. So if somebody tries to scare them with something, a lot of people aggressively go back. Um, but fear is very powerful. Look at uh, some of the scams that we've been seeing where, uh, you know, they started, uh, what, last year, I think it was, beginning of last year, saw some. Um, it's the old, uh, you were on an adult website and we took care of your, uh, you know, your, we took over your webcam and filmed you doing stupid things. And by the way, your password is blah, 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 blah. And then they put in a password up there that's from a 10 year old LinkedIn breach, right? How many people saw somebody that was genuinely scared by that? Cause they're like, oh my gosh, it's gotta be legitimate. They got my password. Well, you had bigger problems on your hand cause it was a 10 year old LinkedIn password, but that kind of stuff, um, does get people to react uh, in a lot of ways. And of course, helpfulness, you know, this is me, I'm, I'm trapped in the UK, I lost my wallet, my passport, I need money to get home, or uh, this is your nephew Johnny's lawyer. Um, he was stopped by the police, uh, said that you can help him with bail, uh, need you to send me some money so I can get him out of jail, you know, that kind of stuff targeting the elderly. This is all helpfulness based stuff. So when we're looking at defending against this, it is really important that we don't try to get everybody into the technical, you know, knee deep kind of stuff. Because quite frankly, you got people, you know, employees that are accountants, you don't want them really trying to dig into this stuff. You really don't. You want them to be able to recognize the lures, the things that are that are yanking their chains. Um, and think about that in a, you know, in a more critical thinking sort of way. Um, we don't want them doing the technical. Stick to the emotional type stuff and then have them report it to say one of us that are more technical that can look into that. Did this really come from this email? Um, this is a social engineering red flag that we've been putting out for a number of years. Um, and I love it because it gives them a quick look. So they get something that kind of freaks them out a little bit. You can look at this. It reminds them to hover the link and all that kind of good stuff. There's a PDF that's available if you want to give it to people. But it, it's really powerful because it, it helps with that. I got an email from HR at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and that's really weird, you know, reminding people that we need to pay attention to this sort of stuff. And having a nice little cheat sheet is very helpful. <clears throat> so that's about all I have for slides right now. This is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, any way you want. Uh, I use the first Twitter email account there. The at Eric Crone is my primary uh, Twitter account. That's the one I use most often. Uh, feel free to reach out to me there. Ask me questions. Uh, I'll be in the, the Discord for a little bit here, uh, but I do have to run fairly quickly after this is done. Uh, but always, always happy to hear from people and, and chat a little bit about that. So question wise, uh, Michael, what do we got out there? So we have Blue Wolf Spirit, uh, who's asking, what if a real video, I'm sorry, what if you have a real video and every, everyone thinks it's fake? Well, depending on what stupid crap you're doing in that real video, that could be a blessing for you, right? Um, that is going to be the other side of it, right? Uh, as we get more critical of all this stuff, we may be willing to, to do exactly that and discount the real things that are going on. Uh, and that can be very dangerous in itself if we go that route. Um, but that's why, actually, I think it's more important to be able to get better ways to check those facts through reputable sources and be able to see if that's real. I think that's a key thing to combating this as well. And I didn't mention that earlier, but I think having some sort of a fact-checking way to do that uh, will help on the, the plus and the minus sides, the real and the fake sides. Excellent. And a follow-up to that from the same person is, um, are there technical ways to detect fakes? Yeah, and I did talk about those a little bit. I don't know if that was before that part. Um, but the, the most common way to do it right now is to look for those artifacts, whether it be in video, whether it be in audio. Um, for the individual, it's a lot tougher because none of us really have these tools around. You pretty much need to be dealing with the larger or higher end sorts of things to be able to do that. Um, it's not real common to have those tools as individuals. Excellent. And I, we have another one here from Canary. Um, <laughs> how about using fakes with sock puppets? <laughs> Are we talking like real sock puppets? Like, hey, you know, 
uh, that sort of thing? Or are we talking about having um, fake people doing uh, certain, you know, uh, plays? I mean, that's that's where I'm seeing it is the, you know, the uh, the sock puppets in the the scam world, where you have somebody that's uh, doing actions and then you replace their face. Uh, absolutely, I see that going to be happening. Excellent. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions on the channel just yet. Maybe we'll keep it open for a few more minutes. Uh, we do have some extra time open. So, Cool. Yeah, I, I wanted to leave some time open here. I'll tell you what, folks, um, you know, since we don't have any questions right now, I'll say this. Um, get out there and play with some of these tools. They, they are free. Um, although most of them tend to lean towards the NVIDIA side, um, sometimes there are some other versions that will run on AMD cards and things like that. It doesn't cost you anything to play around and just grab some 10 second clips and see how all this works. Because the more we learn about what it is we're going to be facing in the future, the better prepared, obviously, we're going to be. And the more able we are to be able to spot them. Um, there were things that, you know, when I first started playing around with this that I didn't spot in some of the deep fakes that we saw out there, you know, some of the pretty common ones. Um, but now I, I have a much better eye towards that. Uh, and I really think that this technology, given the misinformation trend that we have going on, is going to be a big deal in our future. That's my little closing rant, if you will. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. Um, what you got? Earlier you had mentioned a that you had run a test of this of that software that you uh showed on git from github um the voice one or the video one the video one okay. um yeah. you have a, a video that we could take a look at maybe yeah yeah and um i'll have to it's on one of my youtube pages um i just threw it up there to share during conferences i'll, I'll throw it out in um uh i'll throw it out in the track here in a minute when i go get the link to that um, it was just a, a short one I did with uh, Spiceworks. And what I did is I took uh, the host, uh, Justin Ong, and I put uh, Elon Musk's face on Justin Ong. Now, this thing that I put together, when you guys see it, it, it took me like, I think, eight hours of training, you know, less than 10 hours to put the thing together top to bottom. Um, and just knowing that it took me that little bit of time using the absolute defaults to the program uh, should tell you how how interesting and how quickly we're going to be getting to where we can do some pretty serious stuff. There are some artifacts. There's definitely some issues with it, but given that it was all defaults and all in a very short amount of time, I think it's pretty impressive what the tools can do. Excellent. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, cool. Ninny Cole is asking, where can I find the PDF infographic from your last slide? Um, I can drop it in there too. I'm not trying to be too corporate, but I'll I'll drop a link to the PDF in there um, if you guys want to go grab it. Uh, it is a fantastic one. Or if you Google um, "no before social engineering red flags," it's there. I love that little tool. I, I really do. It's just such a great reminder for people. Yeah. And then uh, we have another question from Reggie. Uh, could you comment on ransom fakes? On ransom fakes. Um, are we, we're talking about faking somebody being uh, kidnapped and, and doing ransoms for that. Is that is that what we're talking about? I believe so. Okay. So, you know what? The thing about that is we, we, we actually saw a trend with this where they didn't even have anybody and they were getting paid, right? Um, yeah, I can see where this could be used towards that. But if you look back, uh, this was happening a couple of years ago, a lot in Southern California. Folks would figure out what school little Timmy went to, right? Maybe off the back of the car or Facebook or socially, you know, some other social media presence. And then what was happening is little Timmy goes to school and somebody reaches out to the parents and says, I grabbed little Timmy on the way to school today. If you don't pay me such and such amount, you'll never see little Timmy again. Um, don't contact law enforcement, do not call the school. We have people there. If you do, bam, Timmy's a goner, right? And people would actually pay based on that. They didn't even take anyone. And little Timmy, he's fat, dumb, and happy eating lunch at school, minding his own business, and has no idea this is going on. Um, so they actually don't even need people to do ransoming. Um, that was an interesting trend that uh, happened a number of times, like I said. Uh, but yeah, I can definitely see where they're faking that somebody has been captured. Now, obviously, um, 
they're going to have to move pretty quickly because nowadays we're all fairly easy to get a hold of through phones, you know, and and all that kind of stuff. So it would have to be pretty uh, pretty quick, short-lived sort of things, kind of like the school scam. 